25. Dunkeld, Glengarry, Sky March, Federated Commonwealth, 5th of April, 3056. There hadn't been much fighting here inside the Battle Mac Repair Bay on Castle Hill. Cadet Dave Clay had just come inside from the military parade ground, and the contrast between the ruin outside and the orderly ranks of mechs standing in their repair gantries was startling. It was almost as if the dawn battle had been no more than a nightmare. Almost. Ah, Cadet Clay! An Aztec sergeant he had last seen in battle dress and blackout makeup crossed the gleaming floor with a computer board in one hand and a harassed expression on his face. He'd found time to change into work coveralls, and the lubricant stains on his face and clothes were considerably more in character than his combat garb. We've just finished running the diagnostics on your griffin. It looks ready to go. If you'll follow me, I'll show you what we found. Clay didn't answer, but trailed obediently behind as the tech sergeant led him to the waiting griffin. Cocooned in a repair cradle, the mech was surrounded with gantries to permit repair techs to reach every part of the machine. A handful of techs in red coveralls of the Ordnance Department were still working on an open service hatch just below the drum-shaped LRM on the right shoulder, probably double-checking the warheads in the missile locker. You lost some armor in the chest where the SRM hit you, the sergeant went on, pointing at the scored blackened spot on the left chest. Can't replace that yet. It's not a high enough priority, but when we get a chance it won't take long. In the meantime, remember you've got a weak spot there, right? Clay nodded, his mind flashing back to the lone guardsman's fruitless stand with the rocket launcher. All he could think of was the feeling of paralysis that had gripped him, preventing him from simply killing the man, refusing to kill him, just as he'd refused to fire on the VTOL before it got away. I'll also advise you to limit the use of your jump jets for a while, the Aztec continued. He gestured toward the griffin's left ankle joint. We picked up some stress in the joint. You probably came down a little too hard on it when you made that jump on the roof. That's a job for a full repair crew, and it'll take you offline for about a week. Major McCall passed the word not to take any mech out of service for anything short of a major fault until further notice, so you'll just have to live with it until he says otherwise. Clay nodded vaguely, barely hearing the man. If he'd known there'd been no hostages on the VTOL, he would have knocked it out while it was still on the helipad. Instead, he'd hesitated again, and Governor de Vries had escaped. Any further mischief the man stirred up now would be Davis Clay's fault, pure and simple. No wonder he'd been passed over for a mech warrior's birth time and again. When it came to a real life-or-death situation, every decision he always seemed to make was the wrong decision. He went through the motions of consulting with the crew chief, but inside Clay knew all too well that it was pointless. Even if some of the cadets were tapped for combat against the Free Sky Invaders, he knew his own prospects for ever piloting a mech again were bleak. And in one part of him, one shameful corner of his mind that his father would never have understood or forgiven, he actually felt relieved. It felt good to be back in Legion Grays again. Caitlin de Vries climbed down from the back seat of the UVAC as it sat down at the Dunkeld Maglev station, then turned to take her kit bag from Cadet D'Angelo. She was just heading for the emailed platform when Major King called her back. He was sitting in the front passenger seat of the air cushion utility vehicle, dressed in ordinary tech coveralls, and checking a list on his computer board. He seemed relieved to be back in his usual role as the Legion's chief technical officer. Get your centurion powered up first, cadet, King ordered. Then I want you to turn it over to cadet Galeno. Sir, I thought Galeno was bringing in the archer. King shook his head. Galeno's never handled anything bigger than fifty tons before. You've logged a few hours on the archer, so I'd rather have you bring her in. She nodded. Yes, Major. Good. 
Now let me know if you run into any problems. Dismissed. Caitlin saluted and turned away, hurrying across the open platform toward the last of the flat-topped emailed cars in the maglev train that had arrived in Dunkeld less than an hour before. The train had brought the second contingent of mechs from the cadet company's base at Brander, five more fighting machines added to the Legion's slim assets around the capital. In addition to her centurion and Alex Carlyle's archer, the load included D'Angelo's Wolverine, Hideyoshi Naito's Crusader, and a panther assigned to Cadet Wemis. Now that he had died in the attack on the residence, the Cadet Company's recon lance was in need of a new leader. Caitlin stopped dead in her tracks. What was she thinking of? If the Legion somehow managed to pull itself together and mount a defense against von Bülow's invasion fleet, there'd be more important things on Major McCall's mind than filling out the cadet T O and E. The cadets probably wouldn't be calling any of those mechs their own from now on. More experienced pilots would be taking them into battle, leaving the cadets on the sidelines. If they fought at all. Thanks to her father, that didn't look very likely. Major McCall had ordered defensive preparations resumed as soon as the fighting was over around the residence, but she'd been hearing even veteran legionaries talking about the futility of putting up resistance. Certainly the Planetary Guard weren't going to help now. McCall would probably have to negotiate terms with von Bülow, and they'd end up harsher than the ones her father had agreed to. Caitlin reached the emailed car that held her centurion strapped down in a prone position. A technical team was already working on the reactor and troubleshooting the power circuitry. One of them waved casually and then came to meet her. Aztec Sergeant Stewart was her regular crew chief and had arrived on the email with the centurion. He gave Caitlin a hand up to the car, then led her across to the cockpit hatch without comment. Stewart was a quiet man, never inclined to speak unless he had something to say, but he was one of the best technicians at Brander. There was talk that he was being groomed for a technical officer's commission. Stewart lifted the hatch open and took Caitlin's kit bag while she levered herself into the cockpit. With the mech lying prone, it was hard to move around in the cockpit area, but she finally managed to squeeze herself into the command couch and then reached back and up to take the bag from Stewart. He swung the hatch shut and dogged it manually from the outside. Caitlin looked up through the canopy for a long moment. The view showed nothing but sky, but in her mind's eye she was seeing the tableau in De Villar's quarters when she'd burst in and killed Walters. Another crime to lay at her father's door. Walters and O'Leary and the rest of the professional mercs in the bodyguard had run wild, and though she doubted her father had played much part in events right at the end, those had been his men. And it had been Roger de Vries's decision to abandon the planet's rightful landholders in favor of von Bülow that had set in motion the whole sad train of events. McCall and King had both been lavish in praising her actions, but Caitlin knew there were plenty of other legionaries who suspected her loyalties now. Even Alex Carlyle had been distant when they'd met outside the VR's quarters, just after the fight, and that had hurt most of all. They'd been teamed together in the cadet command lance since the day Caitlin had joined, and the bond between lancemates was supposed to be too tight to permit such doubts. She'd turned her back on her father out of loyalty to the Legion, but now it seemed she was losing both of them. Caitlin de Vries shoved the thought aside. For the moment, she still had her duty, and she'd do it till the end. It was all she had left. She strapped herself into the seat, snapped her cooling vest's power cord into the side of her couch, and pressed the four sensor pads that would connect her neurohelmet to her chest and thighs. Finally, she reached behind the headrest of her seat and found the neurohelmet tucked back into its receptacle. Pulling it out and up, She fitted it carefully over her head and shoulders, then attached the other ends of the sensor plugs into the neck of the helmet. With everything in place, she touched the power stud and felt a tingle in her skull as the neuro helmet came alive. Now it was time to recite the code sequence that the mech's onboard computer had been programmed to recognize and accept. 
her birth date, her mother's, her father's. Without the proper code, the computer's defenses would lock her out of the mech controls altogether. Then it would take half a dozen technicians and another hour or more to clear the program and start from scratch, as they'd already be doing with the Archer to override Alex Carlyle's ID coding. When the authorization was confirmed, the control boards in front of and above her seat came to life. Caitlin next punched in the order for a full systems diagnostic and reported the startup to Sergeant Stewart over her comlink. She half turned in the seat to check the cockpit life support readouts, and that made her think of her kit bag wedged under the front of the seat, out of the way. In battle conditions, she would have stripped down to her shorts, shoes, and the cooling vest in the bag. But today the heat buildup shouldn't be enough to require it. She corrected the airflow inside the cockpit instead, then turned her attention back to the computer readout, to check the progress of the diagnostic. Outside, the technical team was releasing the straps that secured the Mac to the bed of the emailed car. Caitlin double-checked the computer readout, gave a single satisfied nod, and reached for the controls. Raising a prone battle mech was supposed to be one of the single toughest maneuvers a pilot could attempt, but it was child's play next to the problem that occupied most of her thoughts now. Winning back the trust her father's actions had cost her. Alex Carlyle was feeling like an outsider as the discussion in the conference room unfolded. With the fighting over and done, the senior staff had reconvened in the Castle Hill Command Center to consider the situation once again. With planetfall for the first three sky ships expected in less than 24 hours, things were looking grim. McCall as the Legion's senior surviving officer had already put some defensive measures in motion, but it seemed as if they'd been talking to no good purpose for hours on end. And Alex had little enough to contribute here. There wasn't much for an aide to do, and even less for a cadet mech warrior. The governor's treason has changed everything, Captain Sims was saying gloomily. I mean, we had a chance when we thought we could present a unified front, but if the Planetary Guard and the whole damned civil administration are going to turn on us, I don't see how we can put up a fight. I agree, Vargas chimed in. How can we defend a planet that doesn't want defending? Ay, the bloody Sassanach bastard has put us in a fell spot, Davis McCall said. To think he would go behind our backs to deal with the enemy. With the resources we've got on hand, I don't think even the colonel could mount much of a defense, Major Owens said quietly, even if we had the cooperation of the locals. Without it, I just don't know what we can hope to accomplish. I don't want to just give up, McCall said, frowning. What about the plans we were working on before? Is there no hope for any of them? Owens grunted noncommittally and touched a stud on the table in front of him. Curtains moved aside to reveal a floor-to-ceiling monitor screen, which lit up to display a map of the continent of Scotia, showing population centers and the maglev rail lines. An invader could put down almost anywhere, of course, Owen said, but practical strategy would demand an initial attack against an area that could support long-term operations. That means a population center where supplies can be assembled and stored with at least rudimentary spaceport facilities and good logistical links to other targets in the area. This is no lightning raid to touch down anywhere, make the strike, and, and then run for home. But by the same token, they don't have enough lift capacity in those dropships to support a full-fledged invasion effort entirely from space. He paused, favoring McCall with a challenging look. Mech warriors had the reputation for being unconcerned about the essential but unglamorous military science or logistics, while Owens was known for his devotion to such matters. It was one reason he was on the Legion staff. Their ideal move would be to take Dunkeld itself, and that's what they were probably counting on when they got the Vries to cooperate. But it would be a chancy move without on-planet support of some kind. A gutsy CEO might try it, just for the sheer surprise value, though. Not von Bülow, Ross said. No one's ever accused him of being a military genius. 
He likes the slow but steady approach. Owens cleared his throat. Then the logical plan would be to hit an outlying area, and then move along the maglev lines to strike at the capital. He manipulated the map controls on the table in front of him. They won't be able to fight a campaign for the mountains, though they might choose a base in a mountainous area and strike into the plains of Bushan, or Athol from there. I'd say we can safely eliminate Inverte and the other towns of Strathe and Moray as landing sites, the same for Pentland, Mar, and Glencoe. They all have significant mountain barriers blocking an advance on Dunkeld. Kelso and Eastport are also unlikely because of the distance involved. A number of cities and towns vanished from the map. That leaves us with maybe five possibles. Arbroath is the closest to us here, and the terrain the attackers would have to cross is favorable. On the other hand, even a cursory look will show Van Bulo that the Maglev line out that way is in rotten shape for cargo transport. You'll remember we had to tear it up pretty thoroughly when we took out Thane's summer lead, and the new Thane hasn't seen fit to finish repairs yet. I think he's more concerned with rebuilding the rest of the infrastructure in Bouchon. Two consecutive years of famine. Sims trailed off with a shrug. All the more reason why Arbroath's not a good choice, Owens said with a nod. It'd be damned hard to gather supplies in Bouchon these days, and I think they're going to need as many local sources of food and other supplies as they can get. Will they necessarily know that, Major? Alex ventured hesitantly. Just how good is their intel likely to be? Very good. You can bank on it, Cadet. Owens fixed him with a steely glare. If Ryan and Richard Steiner have been planning this move for any time at all, you can be sure they've had plenty of scouts checking us out already. That merchant ship that passed through the system last week now. I bet it carried a few observant passengers, probably picked up some new ones here with lots of useful items of information. He looked back at the computerized notes on the terminal in front of him. If I can continue? Yes, I doubt Arbroath's as a target, and Scone as well. It's too far away from Dunkeld to make a good supply base for a major campaign. But I don't rule either one out entirely. More likely, though, are these three. Haladon and Loch Sheol were both major mining centers in the early days of the Glengarry colony. Both have very good port facilities, though neither of them has seen much use lately. A good crew of techs could have them up and running in a few days, though. They're both in pretty rugged country, Captain Dumont observed. But if they could get in quick and take control of the passes, the terrain would be as much to their advantage as ours, Owens responded. The only thing that would make it dicey is if we were there in any strength. It seems to me, laddie, that Von Bulow maybe doesn't want to take that risk either. McCall rumbled. "'Tis not a good idea to rely on enemy blunders, but we cannot forget that he is planning a campaign against the Grey Death, and that might be enough to make him a wee bit overcautious. Wouldn't be the first time we were overestimated. There were scattered chuckles around the table. Even Owens permitted himself a tiny smile. "'True enough, Mac,' he acknowledged. That's four possible sites, and none of them given much chance, Dumont observed languidly. Don't tell me you think we'll keep the bastards up in orbit by sheer force of reputation. Some fresh chuckles answered the sally. Owens answered him by setting one of the town symbols on the map to blinking. The other site I could think of is Colt Bridge, he said, going on as if Dumont hadn't interrupted. There's no major port facility, but it's a damned good email terminal, and a flat terrain would do well enough for a wilderness landing. Colt Bridge is one of the closest sites of all to Dunkeld, and even if Von Bulow couldn't grab the port fast enough to offset their logistical problems, they could probably set up all the port facilities they'd need around the initial landing area in fairly short order. Alex stirred uneasily. Forgive me, sir. If I'm asking a stupid question, he began slowly, but doesn't this boil down to a case of just not being able to tell which site to cover? 
I mean, Coldbridge is good in some ways, and so are Halidon and Loch Sheol. Or von Bülow might just as well decide to set down in Strate or Moray and risk a longer campaign. I don't see how we can predict where they're actually going to land. He is right, Sims said. With all due respect, Major, your fancy calculations lead exactly nowhere. We've got less than a day left. Half the locals stirred up against us, and a good chunk of the Legion ready to give up the boot. If we can't predict where the bad guys are gonna be, we might as well just forget it. Owens shrugged. Well, maybe you're right. If I had to, I'd vote for Coltbridge. But it's a pretty thin line. But, Alex started to say. Freya de Villar spoke up at the same time. She'd insisted on attending the meeting, but had sat through it silent and withdrawn. Now she cut in with a voice as cold as a glacier. Are you saying that everything that's happened was for nothing? She asked. Her tone was even, but taut with suppressed emotion. I can't accept that. My husband and my son died a few hours ago, and I'm not about to go along with any decision that says their deaths didn't count for anything. No one answered her for a long time. Then McCall cleared his throat. I agree, he said slowly. Tis not what the Legion stands for, to turn tail and run. That brought a dozen simultaneous responses from around the table, everyone trying to take the floor. McCall's voice cut through it all. Enough! This isn't getting us anywhere. When some of the noise subsided, he went on. I think we need to take a little wee break. Reconvene in five minutes. Alex stood up as the hubbub erupted anew. The atmosphere in the room was suddenly oppressive, and he wanted nothing more than an excuse to get away from it, if only for a few minutes. McCall gave him just that, as he gestured for his aide to join him. The Caledonian had found a seat in a quiet corner in the next room, and he watched Alex with a critical eye as the cadet sat down. Sir? Alex ventured after a long, awkward silence. You had something you wanted to add back there, laddie, McCall said. Alex nodded. Just a thought. An idea, I guess. We can't predict where they'll land, but it seems to me we could be ready for them by persuading them to land exactly where we want. By pretending the governor won, is that it? McCall leaned forward, his face taking on an intense expression Alex had rarely seen. Yes, sir. Major Owens said it himself. Van Bulow wants to take the capital, but he wouldn't land here unless he thought he already had local help. It wouldn't take much effort to persuade him he still had it. We don't have Governor de Vries, but we could surely find someone who could pretend to be sympathetic. Maybe we could claim the governor died in the fighting, but that a guardsman put down the cadets who led the attack. He hesitated. Maybe Caitlin could speak on his behalf, She'd be in their intelligence files. It might work, laddie, McCall said. There's the kind of idea your old father might come up with. He frowned. But as divided as we are, I don't know. Alex didn't respond. The weapons master sat for a long time, his staring making Alex feel decidedly nervous under his scrutiny. Finally McCall spoke again. Even if the VR was still alive, I don't know if he could have pulled this lot together after all that's happened. I cannot even blame the ones who don't think we should fight. And I know full well that I cannot get them to change their minds. None of us on the staff have much credibility left after the VR seemed to give in to Von Bülow, and there isn't any time left to educate the people to the contrary. And that's just inside the Legion. No Legion officer will have much pull as far as getting the people on our side, and without them there's damn little hope we can fight. So you think we have to negotiate, sir? Alex tried to hide his disappointment. He'd thought McCall, at least, would want to tough it out. The Major shook his head slowly. There's only one man and one only on Glengarry today who has a prayer of making a stand, young Alex, he said. And that's you. Me? But, Major, I'm just a cadet. Not even a full mech warrior yet. None of them will follow me. 
"'You are also a Carlyle lad,' McCall said gruffly. "'Remember what we were discussing a few days ago? "'In your old father's absence, "'ye are the landholder resident "'and the owner of the grade of legion. "'And for many of these people, "'that counts for more than experience. "'Ye can speak to the legion as your father's son, "'and to all of Glengarry "'as representing the legitimate holder. "'None of the rest of us can do that.' "'Alex Carlyle swallowed once, stunned. "'I... I don't know if I can do it, sir. I mean... He trailed off. If you cannot do it, lad, then no one can. And the Legion, everything Grayson Carlyle ever fought for, is finished. It will not recover from this. Alex looked away. McCall was right. His father's whole career had been built on a reputation for invincibility, even in the face of overwhelming odds or seemingly insurmountable obstacles. The loss of Glengarry and the surrender of the very core of the Legion would be a death blow to the outfit. Grayson Carlyle might try to rebuild around the troops on Borghese with Major Caled, but it would never be the same great death. A gallant stand, even if ultimately futile, wouldn't tarnish the great death's honor the way mere surrender would. He looked back into McCall's sad eyes. I would need help, Alex said reluctantly. "'Yours, and a lot more. "'I just can't believe they'll all follow me "'the way they would follow my father.' "'Ye'll get help a plenty, young Alex,' "'McCall said, his mouth twitching into a smile. "'And they'll follow ya "'if I have to persuade each of them with a club.' "'Alex grinned despite himself. "'Well, even if it's just you and me "'against the whole damned armada, "'we'll give em hell, Major.' "'Aye, that we will.' Colonel Carlyle. 